And so Melissa and I will be talking a bit now about um, impact of, of pain policies and pain atmospherics and, and the current environment on underserved populations. So Janice has just talked about some of the many challenges uh, of uh, being a chronic pain patient. You might imagine then that if you overlay a situation in which English is not your primary language and you have chronic pain, uh, how much more difficult it might be if you overlay facts about um, you know, living in, in overtly very stressful environments, having limited access to healthcare providers of all sorts, that this might in fact uh, exacerbate problems, and indeed it does. We know there's a huge literature, huge literature, uh, going back now 20, 25 years, that says no matter what clinical setting you look at with respect to pain management, if you look in nursing homes, if you look in outpatient, pain, uh, outpatient cancer clinics, if you look in emergency departments, if you look at the level of retail pharmacies, and you ask the question, uh, are there in e inequalities, are there disparities in, in outcomes uh, between uh, populations of patients being treated in these settings? The answer is yes, 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 yes. So uh, I, don't, I won't bother to go through uh, all that data, but uh, it is numerous and it's been published in, you know, in uh, New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, uh, cancer, peer-reviewed journals, no, absolutely no question that these disparities exist. In fact, a few years ago, the Institute of Medicine did in fact do a study about unequal uh, treatment and, and disparities in care uh, that were uh, based on racial and ethnic and socioeconomic grounds. And one of the things that they talked about in that report that was um, how, what might be some of the factors that lead to these disparities in outcomes between, say, in this case, racial minorities and non-minority patients in terms of the quality of care, uh, even if you, and by the way, uh, some of these disparities in outcomes persist even when you actually have populations with equal, putatively equal access to care. So for example, if you look at a Medicare population of patients, of black patients, white patients, Hispanic patients, and you look at uh, any number of health conditions in pain and outside of pain, there may still, you will still actually see uh, identified and observed uh, disparities in outcomes, even in the populations with equal access to care. But looking at factors which might lead to this, uh, the Institute of Medicine concluded that there might be, uh, you know, just frank discrimination, biasing and prejudice, stereotyping and uncertainty. There might be factors related to the operation of health systems and the legal and regulatory environment. And there might be factors around, you know, maybe the clinical appropriateness and need of patient populations. I think one of the really interesting things that I want to actually talk a little bit about today is that there is this whole emerging science now about how um, our social environments actually influence bi biological processes and disease. And so that actually adds another factor to things that, that may be driving disparities and I think has also direct implications for uh, some policy initiatives. Uh, I was asked, and actually as I was thinking about this, you know, do we have, uh, what are some of the, the, uh, the evidence that uh, pain policies disparately impact uh, uh, different populations? So here's actually a study that appeared in pain in uh, January of 2013 uh, that looked at uh, populations of, of black and white patients in pain clinics and showed that in fact in this, this, this study, that there were lower rates of assessment of pain in black patients compared to whites. It showed that actually black patients, uh, these are all patients experiencing chronic pain, were more likely than white patients in these chronic pain settings to be referred for substance abuse services. 
that black patients were actually more likely to have urine drug screens uh, administered as part of their condition for uh, being um, treated, and that they were actually, black patients were actually less likely to be referred on to pain clinics. So these were people being treated in primary care populations. Now, there have been some colleagues of mine who said, well, for example, looking at this issue of urine drug screens. Okay, so here we have a potentially discriminatory pattern, you know, black patients being asked to submit to urine drug screens as opposed to more than white patients. So there are some colleagues of mine who said, well, that means we should have universal precautions, that everybody getting an opioid should, be, should get uh, a urine drug testing. Well, Problem with that, I see a two. One is a science question. There actually hasn't been any good studies to show that, urine, that, that routinely urine drug testing people actually does have a significant impact in terms of uh, changing behaviors around misuse and abuse of drugs. There's some small studies which showed it might. There are some small studies which showed that it might not. There haven't been any big studies. So it doesn't make sense to me to subject the whole population of people to a procedure with cost, as Janice has said, and which with a stigma attached to it, that actually might not be scientifically valid. And then I think there's another issue, which is, as I've, uh, as, as I've said on other occasions, which, you know, the question is the, the stigmatization issue, and what are we really saying to patients with chronic pain who require opioids as to how we actually see them. Do we primarily see them as a drug addict waiting to happen, or do we see them primarily as a person in pain who requires drugs for a legitimate purpose? So I think there, there are issues here, but there clearly are, this is a, one of the cases in which, or examples in which there are documented disparities. Now, the, uh, as I said, the Institute of Medicine, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, uh, various national um, uh, programs and resources have looked at this disparity question. And of course, the question often comes up and is, is clearly important are what, how do, in fact, the social determinants of health impact these disparities? And we know that social determinants impact health, and these social determinants are in um, various sectors. There's socioeconomic, uh, there are behavioral, they're psychosocial, uh, they're related to education, occupation, and income. These are all, and this is a model actually that has been uh, pr uh, you know, promulgated by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. All of these factors can in fact influence health, can influence outcomes of treatment and interventions, and are applicable in all patients. But the question is, to the extent to which some of these factors actually drive uh, disparities. Now, I'm going to make a slight digression here from pain to talk about disparities in another condition to make an important point and an exciting point, I think, an interesting point, which is uh, the, there is a really interesting emerging science as to how all of these social economic or, or these social factors may in fact influence biology of disease. So, for example, uh, there is a uh, population of women who have uh, triple negative breast cancer. That is, uh, women who have, uh, who have uh, whose biomarkers for breast cancer who don't have uh, estrogen receptor uh, expression or a progesterone receptor or epidermal growth factor receptor. And we know that in all women, black, white, Chinese, all women who are triple negative, that this actually pretends a poorer prognosis in general for their breast cancer than women who are not triple negative in these factors who have positive expression of these. So if you look here in the case of, say, uh, African-American, just look at this middle panel, African-American women, you see that African-American women who are triple negative breast cancer actually uh, do worse than women in these Kaplan-Meier curves than African-American women who are, who are not triple negative. And if you look at, uh, but if you look at 
European American, white women, and African American women who are triple negative, in that population of all women who are triple negative, African American women still do worse than white women who are triple negative. So what is the basis of this disparity? Well, it could be that African American women are being treated later with disease. There could be any number of things that relate back to that chart uh, in terms of the social determinants of health. But one of the intriguing things is that there are now these investigations which are looking at how some of these social factors, things like income disparity, lack of access to healthy foods, living in unsafe, stressful neighborhoods, lack of exercise, which drives comorbid conditions like obesity and diabetes, which activate stress hormonal responses, actually then play into driving um, uh, cell signaling pathways, which promote aggressive, more aggressive tumor growth. Okay, so here is a, a model by which psychosocial factors may in fact influence biology, even in this very defined population of, of women with triple negative breast cancer. We also now know in this exploding field of what's called epigenetics that um, there, it, 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 it appears that from mostly now, this data is mostly derived from animal studies, but I'm gonna show you some human data in a second. It appears that there are social factors such as the way in which mothers nurture their offspring, which can in fact influence how the genes, how genes are expressed in their offspring. Now, this has only been observed in rats and rodents and mice. This has not been observed in people, but it's, these are very intriguing observations. And um, uh, so the idea here is that, you know, uh, uh, here are genes and, you know, we, we, we normally think that, you know, DNA makes RNA, RNA makes protein, and, uh, but we know that that's a highly and complexly regulated process now and that there are these uh, all kinds of sophisticated and complex signaling pathways which regulate how genes are transcribed. And, and very importantly, it appears that the extent to which uh, small carbon groups called methyl groups are attached to the DNA and protein complexes called histones, how the histones are attached and deattached and packaged DNA are critical factors in regulating how genes are expressed and that this, particularly the demethylization and the histone activation and inactivation of these protein complexes or DNA can be influenced by, it appears, by the physical and social environment. So there's a classic study, again, in rats, in which you take a group of rats who, who have a highly nurturing mothers, and you look actually at the methylation status of their DNA in particular genes, and you show that they're very different from the offspring of rats who were reared by mothers who were not nurturing. Same genes, uh, but different rates of regulation. And, Needless to say, we're now in getting data that actually pain may influence gene expression and regulation. So again, we've got the you know, Watson Crick DNA structure, but what's, what we now know is that DNA is actually highly packaged in these histone protein complexes and can be methylated with these carbon groups. And these are very, very important processes in regulating how these genes are expressed. And for example, if you take a group of people now, this is human data, people, patients who have been treated with opioids or who have been in chronic methadone maintenance programs and compare them to age match controls, people who have not been exposed to opioids, you actually can see different 
rates of methylation of the DNA in these two populations of patients. So, so, here, this is a, so here is a graph showing uh, the extent of methylation in the uh, gene region. Actually, this is a gene that codes for the opiate receptor. And you see that uh, compared to controls, people who are heroin addicts maintained on methadone have a much higher rate of methylization, methylization of the opiate receptor gene. And this is, another, this is actually a, a group of proteins that appear on white blood cells of, of controls and addicts. And you can show that the DNA, even in these circulating white blood cells, so these are DNA from white blood cells and addicts that are more highly methylated than in controls. So this is actually a potential biomarker because you can actually right, sample white blood cells and look at methylization status. Um, uh, studies such as these have also now shown that if you look at people treated with opioids and compare them to people not treated with opioids, that you see different methylization status. And in fact, that the extent of methylization, again, in these white blood cells, DNA of these white blood cells, actually the extent of methylization is actually correlated with the pain scores reported in this population. Now, what we don't have yet is well, okay, well, what about the extent of stress <laughs> in a chronic cancer, in a chronic pain patient versus uh, a, a chronic pain patient who is not as stressed by some measure? What is the rate of their or the extent of their methylization, methylization of DNA, and whether that can be shown to be correlated in any way with pain scores? But that kind of data is coming. Okay, so what does this all mean for pain policy? Well, I, I guess I want to make another point by digressing a bit, and this gets back to the politics and to health policy. Uh, so here's a graph of uh, extent, uh, extent of spending by health spending, total health spending by a percent of GDP from a number of countries. And you see here the Scandinavian countries and Western European countries and the US by far spend the most money as a percentage of their GDP. And here's the United States. Now, there is a light bar here and there's a dark bar. This is total spending on all kinds of health care resources. So there's, there's health care expenditures, things like spending for you know, what we spend on um, on uh, curative care, rehab care, long-term care, ancillary service, diagnostic imaging. The light bars actually reflect the total amount of healthcare spending, but healthcare spending spent on social aspects of healthcare. So these would be things like survivor's benefits, disability payments and sickness benefits, family support, unemployment benefits, housing support. So here, Sweden, so Sweden spends the most and of their per greatest percentage of their GDP in healthcare of any country in the world. But notice that the ratio of social spending to just strict medical services spending is actually much greater than is the United States, right? And in fact, if you, if you break out these ratios more, you see that the United States is actually a huge outlier here that we, of all the, particular, with all the money we spend, we're actually the country that spends the least amount, Mexico down here. We're on this side of the line, which is not the good side of the line to be on. We actually spend the least percentage of our total healthcare spending on the kinds of social supports that people need to be healthy. In fact, we know that higher rates of spending on social services actually correlate with health outcomes such as greater life expectancy, lower infant mortality, and fewer potential years of life loss. There's an interesting quirk here that higher rates of social spending also seem to be associated with an increase in low birth weights. I'm not sure why that is, but that's the data. We don't know, but, so that's a negative. But um, So it would suggest to me that one of the things that we should be thinking about, at least, if we are saying that, um, you know, in this era of healthcare reform, is, you know, how are we spending our money, 
right? And should we be spending a greater percentage of the total healthcare spending on social supports for healthcare? And you would, could make the case that this would be a, one of the potential strategies and solutions for addressing some of the issues in healthcare disparities uh, of outcomes among populations. So there are questions here that I just want to end by saying, and I'll ask my colleague, Melissa, uh, to come up, Melissa Robinson, and she'll kind of expound on it from her perspective uh, here in uh, looking at these things on the ground level in, in Kansas City. But are there biological mechanisms which explain some of the aspect of disparate pain incidence, prevalence, and outcomes that are correlated with gender, race, and, and ethnicity? What are the social determinants related to health behaviors that are most important in influencing pain outcomes? Are there connections between environmental factors and health factors, behaviors that influence the biology of pain mechanisms that might explain some aspect of the difference in pain expression and outcomes in diverse ethnic and racial populations? So this link between the pain experience and previous environmental exposures, adverse social experiences, medication, et cetera, are all very important and rich areas which need to be addressed because, again, we now have this emerging evidence that these things not only affect, not only are operative by the way in which they influence how health systems behave and how we as clinicians and, and patients behave, but they, in fact, may also influence the biology of some of these processes, a really interesting, interesting notion. So with that, I'll ask uh, my colleague Melissa to come up and give her take on how these relate to um, her work here in Kansas City. Have you one. have one? Great. Is it on? Is it working? Can you yes. all hear me? Yes. Good afternoon. I got a good hello there. Again, my name is Melissa Robinson. I work for the uh, Black Healthcare Coalition here in Kansas City. We're a grassroots organization. And we look at the, um, the health disparities that exist in the community. And we have a three-legged stool in which we do our work, which um, includes access to care, um, advocacy, and also health promotion. And so I'm going to try to interweave some of those things as it relates to the implications of pain. Um, I'm glad to see my good friend Don Giffen. He knew me way back when, when I was a kid. Nice to see you. Um, but let's um, develop some um, basic understanding as it relates to the social determinants of health and what social determinants are. And so if you think about the basic necessity and the availability of those resources that you need to live your everyday life. So things like education, transportation, income, um, access to food, healthy, affordable food. Those are the social de determinants that we're talking about. And when we have environments that lack that, we need to take a deeper look at how is it that we're creating this social and physical environment that promotes health for everyone, okay? And so there's three ways that we um, look at doing that. And so how are we exploring the programs and the policies that we have related to creating a physical and social environment that promotes health for everyone? Um, the city of Kansas City, I'm also a health commissioner for the city of Kansas City, and um, I just came back from a meeting this morning where we're talking about doing our CHIP planning, our community health improvement planning, and one of the things that we're really excited about is this idea of health in all policies. And so that goes back to, you know, what are, how are we exploring those policies that we have that create uh, unhealthy environments, those social and physical factors, but you really just can't stop there. And that's where I've been most vocal in my work because being a Kansas Cityan and uh, living here all my life, I remember when Jim um, Kakomo came up with, is it good for the children? And the city of Kansas City put together these policies around 
all of the policies that we look at, we're gonna be looking at, is it good for the children? And it also, it comes with like a little checkbox, like, okay, we check that off, but we're not being very intentional about that. And so we do have to explore those things and make sure that it's just not something extra that we're doing. Um, but also there's two other components that are extremely important when we think about policies and when we think about spending, um, one of which is, you know, how are we creating common goals um, uh, around pain and around topics and around the social determinants of health and where we are now and where we aspire to be? And not only those common goals, but how are we creating roles for people to help us get to those goals? And how are we developing those relationships? Um, and so the final uh, tenet as it relates to addressing the social determinants of health that oftentimes impact underserved people, and so it's connected to this conversation around pain, is you know how are we really, really looking at maximizing our opportunities for collaboration to get to those goals? Because oftentimes we do not collaborate in meaningful ways. And when we think about collaboration, it's like, okay, you have this and I have this, let's come together and create this. But we don't talk about sharing risk and sharing the rewards. Um, and what we have to give up. And so in this space of looking at the social determinants of health, we also have to talk about, have those hard conversations of uh, things that are around that. So I'm thinking about my uh, client population that we, the, that we serve, and um, I really thoroughly enjoyed Janice's presentation and uh, when she was talking about this biopsychosocial problems and integrating that in her care. I thought about the clients that I serve that have multiple children, that have relationship problems with the person that they're supposed to be rearing those children with, that has to take three stops on the way to getting to work, that their lights are off at home, and they have to take a second job, and then little Johnny acts up at home, and they have to take off from work to go get on the bus and go address little Johnny's problems. And so when you think about all those compounding things together, who has the time, the energy, the resources to be thinking about their biopsychosocial problems and how that's all integrated? And we oftentimes don't think about that, but that is a clear example of the social determinants of health that people are faced with um, that we don't um, get a chance to uh, address or even consider. So in thinking about the Black Healthcare Coalition and what we're doing around chronic pain um, and the whole access to care conversation, which is compounded with how do we want government to spend its dollars regarding um, our, our social services in our community, we, want, we, we appreciate and we applaud the government for thinking about you know, the number of providers that are available within a community because if you don't have the providers there to address um, your chronic issues, then again, it, it exacerbates this whole thing and access to care is, such, is certainly a social determinant of health. And just the, the lack of a continuum of care for individuals that are um, dealing with chronic pain, they don't know where to start and a lot, a lot oftentimes the doctors that they encounter aren't helping them um, to get there. And so we spend a lot of time with advocacy and advocating for the patient and encouraging the patient to advocate for themselves. And so although we have a patient navigation program, um, we're also really trying to empower people to really um, help them to have the tools to do that in their space. And thinking about our safety net system, because the, the clients that we serve, a vast majority of them are depending on the safety net community to address their health concerns. And in our community in Kansas City, um, as Myra knows and the folks at uh, the Center for Practical Bioethics knows that there is not a protocol or there's not treatment that's being delivered in our safety net system as it relates for people who have chronic pain. We kicked off on um, Tuesday, or this past Saturday a whole thing at one of our safety net systems, Samuel Rogers, around this chronic pain um, ish, uh, initiative that we're doing with um, African American churches. And a lot of our safety net systems, they're seeing people with diabetes 
and our diabetic patients have diabetes peripheral neuropathy, which causes chronic pain, but their diabetes provider does not treat their pain and not a good referral system to um, help them to deliver that. And so when we think about the standards of care that we put on our safety net system, we need to expand that to make sure that people are being seen in a holistic manner and that their continuum of care is being provided for for the, for the issues that they have. And then making sure that holistic treatments are, are covered under insurance, especially insurances um, that is connected with um, individuals that are experiencing po um, um, poverty, like Medicaid and the whole um, health insurance marketplace and some of those policies that people are picking, they don't have the opportunity to get holistic care. And so being able to advocate for things of that nature. And so finally, with um, health promotion is so important because oftentimes our clients, they don't even recognize that their pain is real and that it's something that needs to be addressed. And so we're, we're really um, providing a space for this health promotion work with our clients one-to-one -to, -one to talk about, you know, your pain is real. You do really need to talk about this when you go before your provider and just empowering them to take action and overall making sure that their health is a priority because when you think about that client that I described, oftentimes their health is not a priority for them, but those other list of things that resources that they don't have access to for their everyday life. And so thank you for your presentation um, and the uh, reflection opportunity for me. Melissa, can you, before we take questions, can you clarify one thing? You said uh -huh. the diabetes providers don't address their pain. Now, did, was, is that because when the patients bring it up, they say, I, I don't do this, or is there a policy that they don't address pain? They just Tell don't me. treat pain. They treat diabetes, but they don't treat pain. Even though pain is part of the diabetes yes, process. Even though that's a part of their complication right. and that's a part of their illness and disease. Right. But um, even in talking to this one provider in this instance, didn't even want to address pain at right. all. So, right. Right. so yeah. I was, um, <laughs> I, I was also talking to an individual who has two cancers, multiple myeloma, prostate cancer, it's terrible pain, and his oncologist would not treat his pain mm -hmm. because Basically, both diseases were in remission, but his pain was being driven actually by a, a neuropathic pain problem related to his myeloma chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. So he didn't have active myeloma, but his oncologist said, I won't treat your pain. And uh, actually, it's a very interesting story because this individual went to, was it being seen in primary care? Mm -hmm. They require urine drug testing. Mm -hmm. There was a urine drug test that didn't show all of the opiates that he was taking, and he was sim just simply abruptly cut mm -hmm. off mm -hmm. with no uh, effort to find, help him yeah. find okay. another doctor. So yeah. these are the kinds of things. So it's interesting to me. So my right. question would be, why would a person who treats diabetes not treat the whole disease, exactly. and why would a patient who treats cancer not treat the whole mm -hmm. disease? That's yeah. one of the problems here, of course, yeah. right? And yeah, going back to the stereotypes, but I won't get into my soapbox on that. Yeah, go ahead. Do we have uh, questions? Uh, I think so. Uh -huh. Yes. She'll bring the microphone to you. I just have a comment. Um, to the last part that you just discussed about integrative um, mm -hmm. medicine. Yeah. Um, a lot of medicine has been so compartmentalized into specialization. Um, I'm an ICU provider. I'm a nurse practitioner, um, but I also do palliative care. And one of my visions is that palliative care should just be standard of care with all chronic disease management. That includes pain management. Because when you look at a whole person mm -hmm. experiencing disease, a lot of times that symptom management, when it's missed, is what creates readmissions, which hospitals are getting dinged for now. Mm -hmm. They're not coming back having another heart attack. They're coming back because they're short of breath yeah. or because they're having pain or because they can't afford their meds. 
or whatever. And so my vision is that palliative care would just be part of standard of care, which all, all of the um, medical societies and guidelines for every specialty address, they say you should be doing it, but nobody does it. Mm -hmm. And it's because nobody knows how. They've never been trained that way. Mm -hmm. In my field, um, I especially work with a lot of surgeons. They believe that when you sign a consent, that you're signing up for recovery, which means you're gonna endure the pain. Um, and as a nurse, I, many of my nurses are morally distressed because they take care of patients who are suffering. Physical therapists are taking care of patients who are suffering. Mm -hmm. And they don't get very far with physicians asking for more pain meds or benzos or whatever to help them through the symptomatology of their recovery because they say, you sign the consent, you're signing up for recovery. Mm -hmm. So um, your point is, is very well taken. It is exactly what's going on in practice. It is not integrated medicine. Um, it is specialization and fragmentation. My, my son's snapping to that. Yes. <laughs> yes, there's some questions back here. Uh, Jen, uh, there's a woman in the back. Yeah, there. And then Dr. Foley. I've been yeah. sitting here trying to think, who should I refer this question to? And then I realized that, Richard, you are with divinity and medicine. And I think uh -oh. my question is more <laughs> on the divinity side. My name is Rhonda Kiros, and I'm a chaplain uh, resident at St. Luke's Hospital on the plaza here in Kansas City. And uh, this has been a very important forum for me to sit in and listen to. However, what I find that's missing is uh, pain in relation to spirituality. Um, mm -hmm. So that uh, whenever I walk into a patient's room, while I'm well aware that he or she might be in uh, great physical pain, I'm also very much aware that they're in spiritual pain as well. And um, I think I'm missing hearing the connection right. between the two. Right. And would like to hear, even if it's just a small, paragraph on how the two are uh, related and how even at a forum like this we can address the issue. Yeah. Well, you, you can jump in here too, Melissa. They're clearly related and you know, the, uh, uh, Dr. Foley mentioned Cicely Saunders who taught us about this notion of total pain that, you know, pain is uh, not just physical. It it's relates to uh, emotional aspects of the uh, experience of illness uh, as well, than, and the notion of, of, of a people's notion of, uh, you know, what the meaning of this pain and, and is, and are there, there issues around guilt? Are there issues around um, needing to uh, reconcile with family? There are all kinds of issues which actually influence the perception and the impact of pain on the individual. And a truly comprehensive pain uh, approach actually requires that one assess all of those dimensions and provide counseling and other supports for the psychosocial, spiritual components of the experience. And of course, uh, first of all, most clinicians are not comfortable with uh, kind of with going into the spiritual aspects of the experience. Uh, chaplains are wonderful, and I think chaplains should be engaged more. Um, and um, um, and then the question is, you know, but again, it often comes down to, you know, uh, how does the system put up barriers to uh, getting the patients the kinds of time that are needed by these by the providers to address these symptoms and to provide the counseling. So I think those are all very important points. And, and I and but when I say comprehensive pain assessment, I'm meaning measures beyond just a physical assessment of pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. we do have a, ch a challenge in the faith community because we sing hymns like, you know, he'll take your pain away. And so there is a disappointment that you know comes with you know having that pain and that not being taken away yeah. so kathy you have a question um, thanks thanks for that discussion so i have um 
a question, because it seems like an opportunity, I'm also listening to your presentation and Rich's um, in advance of that, is that um, there's a need to document this lack of pain treatment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And one of the issues that, that I've had a particular interest in is that in those patients who are um, uninsured or less insured or covered by Medicaid, we have no, um, or I don't know, a full documentation of how little their access to alternatives to pain medicine are, including integrative approaches, physical therapy approaches, um, drug therapy approaches. So, you know, is that, uh, so everybody's looking for ideas, but it seems to me that there's an opportunity here because of, of your engagement with the, the Pains Initiative to, to do that kind of narrative right. investigation yeah. so that in a population we could have a much better sense mm -hmm. of really that the, di uh, the, that the uh, diabetes experts are not going to treat pain and they don't have access to pain medicine so they don't get a standard protocol. Mm -hmm. The reason I'm raising this is that these are easy things to do because then you could put in a standard protocol and everybody would have to get it. You know, and the doctor would check it off and Medicaid would pay for it and the pharmacy would deal with it. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I think there are solutions, but people don't believe that there's a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I don't know, Myra, if there's an opportunity for you to espouse upon the programming that you're working on with um, safety nets and getting funders to invest in that type of work um, is an uphill battle as well. Um, and so there is a, a formation of, of that work because it is documented in Healthy People 2020 as it relates to the underserved populations and their access to treatment. Right. Um, but getting that attention of, of our medical homes, it takes an investment, it takes intentionality, um, and it takes buy-in, um, and so I'm very proud in resources, in which I talked about the funders, but I'm very proud of the work that Myra and her team is doing around that. If we could only get the investment and the resources we need for that. Right. Thank you, Rich. Yeah, so thank you.